Thank you. Mr. Raskin. Uh, thank you kindly, Mr. Chairman. And um, I, I was glad that, uh, that my colleague, Mr. Goldman from New York, was able to um, answer some of the uh, surprising things that uh, we heard from um, our esteemed colleague, Ms. Mace, right before we, we had our break. Um, and, um, the, you know, it's very clear that uh, Joe Biden is, uh, th th there's no evidence that has uh, turned up over the last seven months that Joe Biden is guilty of any criminal wrongdoing, any high crime and misdemeanor, uh, much less uh, prostitution, bribery, money laundering, or any of the um, uh, crimes that were set forth in that laundry list that, uh, that Ms. Mace offered at the end. So I, I do hope she will clarify that. Um, let's see. Um, Ms. Wayne, um, you're here as the Assistant General Counsel of Johnson & Johnson. Do I have that right? Yes, sir. And um, Johnson & Johnson paid uh, $5 billion out uh, in the opioid litigation and $4 billion in the talcum uh, powder litigation. Is that right? Those numbers roughly correct? Congressman, as far as I'm aware. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so are you here to complain about meritorious lawsuits being brought by consumers in cases like these or frivolous and meritless cases being brought by consumers? Congressman, um, an excellent point. We're not here to talk about limiting aggrieved consumers' access to justice. We're here to talk about transparency, regulation, disclosure around third-party litigation funding, which has an effect of actually diluting the claims that have merit with the influx of meritless lawsuits. Okay, so you have no problem with the litigants who went to court uh, in the opioid cases or in other mass toxic tort cases, the BP oil spill or the talcum powder case or so on. Congressman, as a lawyer, yeah. I believe in access to justice. Gotcha. And, and there were no Rule 11 sanctions that your company sought against any of the litigants in those cases, right? The ones that you mentioned, Congressman? Yes. Not as far as I'm aware. In the okay. mass tort context, it's actually extremely different. Um, because we have no access to information regarding the thousands of claims brought against us, because plaintiffs aren't required to actually produce evidence of product usage or injury alleged from the product, um, we're essentially hamstrung from using Rule 11 to bring sanctions on those individual cases. We're also ham hamstrung in many cases from filing uh, 12B6 motions because that motion practice is usually suspended in the MDL process. So you're saying you can't move to dismiss in a class action lawsuit? Not a class action, Congressman, right? We're talking about multi-district litigation, which is a different animal. Yeah. Multi-district litigation, the aggregation of thousands of claims, Typically, what we see are judges suspending motion practice, 12B, 12E, the usual discovery practices. Yeah. Um, okay, well, um, th that might be something interesting to look at. But to my understanding, anybody who brings vexatious, frivolous, or meritless litigation can be sanctioned by the courts. And, um, but I appreciate your candor in saying that that was not the case. Um, in the opioid litigation or in uh, the, the talcum powder case? What I said, Congressman, is that we believe in access to justice. So yeah. those who brought those cases um, had their day in court. Um, we don't stand in the way of that, of course. Right. And as I mentioned earlier, we don't believe that the talcum powder cases have merit. We believe that that is actually all driven by third-party litigation funding. All right, fair enough. Well, maybe we should stop there because we're just going to disagree about that. And, and obviously, the settlement speaks for itself. Um, one of our colleagues, actually several of our colleagues raised this issue, but one of them asked whether the Chinese government might have used intellectual property law or lawyers to achieve power over the U.S. government and to undermine American uh, society. And I think I found at least one good answer to this question, and I'd like to submit for the record this November 6, 2018 Associated Press article headlined, China grants 18 trademarks in two months to Donald Trump and, uh, and daughter. Um, and uh, in the early days of the Trump administration, uh, Donald Trump and his daughter Ivanka got 18 trademarks from uh, the Chinese government that she had been unable to get uh, before. And there were lots of uh, allegations about conflict of interest and influence peddling in the scheme. So I'd like to submit that for the record, Mr. Chairman. Very good. 
Very good. Yeah, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gosar. He complied I, with the subpoena. We, 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 we uh, would have expired. We would have loved that. Do any other compliance. members wish to be heard? Mr. Chair recognizes Ms. Mays from South Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Chairman Comer. Um, first of all, my first question is who bribed Hunter Biden to be here today? That's my first question. Um, second question, you are the epitome of white privilege, coming into the Oversight Committee, spitting in our face, ignoring a congressional subpoena to be deposed. What are you afraid of? You have no balls to come up here and... M Mr. Chairman, point of inquiry. Mr. Chairman... Um, if the, the lady recognizes if, if the general, if the general lady I wants to hear from things. Hunter Biden, we can hear from him right now, Mr. And Chairman. Let's take a vote and hear from I'm Hunter speaking. Biden. What are, are you afraid of? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Why, order, why order, order. Are, order. are women allowed to, allowed to speak, speak in here right. or no? Are, okay. are women allowed to speak in order. here or no? Did you keep interrupting me? I, I'll interrupt the you chairman. I don't know that he's a lady. I think that that Hunter Biden should be arrested right here, right now, and go straight to jail. Our nation is founded on the rule of come law. Come on, come on. And the premise come that on. the law applies equally to everyone, no oh, oh, matter what your last point name Point of order, Mr. Chairman. Uh, point of order. It doesn't matter who you are. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. Biggs over Donald here. Donald Trump Jr. Biggs over here. Uh, state your point, Mr. Biggs. Yeah, my, my point of order is this. Are we going to continue on with, with this blatant interruption? It, this, this is absurd and inappropriate. I intend to give my statement. I don't intend to have anybody interrupt uh, I'm not going to interrupt your statements. I think you should have decorum and courtesy and don't act like a bunch of nimrods. You just interrupted a woman. And, and that's five. You know, I got, I got we, permission. Can we I agree? Did, Everyone Mr. has Mr. five Chairman, minutes. Can we agree? Point, point of order again. The assertion that I interrupted was absolutely false. That's typical of the gentleman who spoke it. I got permission to speak from the chairman. I spoke... I was interrupted yet again right. by the gentleman who doesn't choose to go through the chair and follow proper order. I encourage us, I, I, I think if we're going to have any respect at all, we need to have proper decorum. Well, you're well said, well said. I'd like to finish. The rules are everyone's going to be recognized for five minutes. Anyone that wants to be recognized will be recognized for five minutes. Ms. Mace has four minutes and 13 seconds left. Chair recognizes Ms. Mace. It does not matter who you are, where you come from, or who your father is, or your last name. Yes, I'm looking at you, Hunter Biden, as I'm speaking to you. You are not above the law at all. The facts in this case are crystal clear. This committee used and issued a lawful subpoena to Hunter Biden, a critical witness in this committee's investigation into Biden family corruption. Hunter Biden and his lawyers did not claim privilege of any kind because clearly he has none. They didn't contest the legitimacy of our reasons for issuing the subpoena, no reasons, because they clearly are legitimate. And yet, he refused to comply. Uh, Trump's family members, Don Trump Jr., he, uh, he did not defy a congressional subpoena. He showed up multiple times for multiple depositions for several hours. Um, in doing so, you know, Hunter Biden broke the law. He did so deliberately. You did so flagrantly. You showed up on the Hill, on the Senate side, the day of that congressional subpoena to defy it and spit in the face of this committee. That's what you did. The question the American people are asking us is, what is Hunter Biden so afraid of? Why can't you show up for a, d a congressional deposition? You're here for a political stunt. This is just a PR stunt to you. This is just a game that you are playing with the American people. You're playing with the truth. Um, Hunter Biden wasn't afraid to sell access to Joe Biden to the highest bidder when he was in elected office. He wasn't afraid to trade on the Biden brand, peddle influence, and share those ill-gotten gains with members of his, of his family, including Joe Biden. He wasn't afraid to compromise the integrity of the presidency and vice presidency by involving Joe Biden in shady business deals with our foreign adversaries. But Hunter Biden, you were too afraid to show up for a deposition. And you still can't today. Um, I believe that Hunter Biden should be held completely in contempt. I think he should be hauled off to jail right now because it wasn't long ago, too, my friends on the other side of the aisle, um, that you also believed in the, the power of a congressional subpoena. Not long ago at all. You believed in holding those who refused to comply with a congressional subpoena accountable. And I stood with each and every one of you. I am the only member in this room today who has held a member of my own party in contempt of Congress for not showing up for a subpoena. 
and I see nothing but complete hypocrisy on the other side of the aisle. The ranking member of this committee even so eloquently put it, the lesson is please tell your children out there in America, if you get a subpoena to go before Congress, go. You have a legal responsibility to do so. So the hypocrisy is stunning. What are we to tell our children today? There's nothing the other side can say with a straight face. As the only member of this committee to vote to hold a member of contempt of my own party, let me be clear, this should not be a partisan issue. If Congress issues a subpoena, you show up, period. This is not a responsibility we take lightly. It brings no joy for us to do this, but the president's son broke the law and must be held accountable in the same way anybody else would. I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to do so. And my last message to you, Hunter Biden, you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes. And will I the gentle lady yield for a question? Will, will the gentle lady yield? Will my friend yield from South Carolina? Sure. Um, I, I do want to commend the gentle lady who was the only Republican who stood up uh, and voted to hold in contempt the Republican members of the House who blatantly and categorically refused to comply with subpoenas that came from the bipartisan January 6th committee. I would like to ask my friend Ms. Mace from South Carolina um, whether she's aware of all the case law which says that the committee has to engage in good faith interaction with the witnesses they've called and they're supposed to arrive at a solution. And what do you think about the fact that the chairman on multiple occasions gave this witness the opportunity to come before the full committee and he agreed to that? We issued a congressional subpoena, and I know with your constitutional law background, you know exactly what that means, and he should have showed up. And because of your vote and because of your statements, you should be voting to hold, hold this man in contempt of Congress today, right now, if you're going to be consistent on your own policies and your own words. Gentlelady's time's expired. Chair, recognize Mr. Moskowitz for five minutes. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's good to see you after a long break. So... I'm listening to the gentlelady from South Carolina about the witness being afraid to come in front of the committee. It's interesting. He's here. He doesn't seem to be too afraid. In fact, for some reason, the chairman, who on multiple occasions invited the witness to come on TV, Apparently, the chairman wants to pretend like his statements on television or in interviews don't matter. But it didn't happen once. It didn't happen twice. It happened multiple times. The chairman said the witness can choose whether to come to a deposition or to a public hearing in front of the committee. The witness accepted the chairman's invitation. It just so happens the witness is here. If the committee wants to hear from the witness, and the chairman gave the witness that option, then the only folks that are afraid to hear from the witness with the American people watching are my friends on the other side of the aisle. I don't know if there's a proper motion, Mr. Chairman, but I'll make a motion. Let's vote. Let's take a vote. Who wants to hear from Hunter right now, today? Anyone? Come on. Who wants to hear from Hunter? The motion's out of order. Yeah. No one. So I'm a visual learner, and the visual is clear. Nobody over there don't want to hear from the witness. Member for 12 minutes for his opening statement. Mr. Chairman, thank you very kindly. Um, with any luck, today marks the end of perhaps the most spectacular failure in the history of congressional investigations, the effort to find a high crime or misdemeanor committed by Joe Biden, and then to impeach him for it. In prior hilarious episodes of this long-running madcap series, America got to see the following. One, nearly 20 fact witnesses who could not identify a single act of wrongdoing by President Biden, much less a high crime and misdemeanor, and who overwhelmingly testified that Biden was not involved in any of his family's business adventures. Two, three expert witnesses called by the majority itself who said nothing that they had seen in the tens of thousands of pages of documents uh, adduced by the majority even remotely approached the level of a high crime and misdemeanor. Bank records would show exactly what all the witnesses told us, 
that Joe Biden was not involved in his family members' businesses. Repeated voyeuristic displays of pornographic images by the majority completely irrelevant to any conceivable legislative or investigative purpose. A star witness, Gal Luft, who turned out to be a Chinese agent and an illegal arms trafficker on the run from American justice. And the key piece of evidence which launched the entire zany goose chase an FD-1023 form in which the FBI duly recorded a completely fictional tip about a $5 million bribe to Vice President Biden peddled by Alex Smirnoff, who has been criminally indicted by a Trump-appointed U.S. attorney, Special Counsel David Weiss, for felony counts of systematically lying to the FBI and constructing a false record about Joe Biden and now sits in jail in California as a flight risk while the world studies his long-standing and extensive ties to Russian intelligence. Today, the good chairman and his ace MAGA detectives have finally jumped the shark. The comedy of errors comes crashing to an end as House Republicans in more than a dozen Biden districts beg for mercy and the committee throws a flabby Hail Mary pass three weeks after the Super Bowl's over. So today, we revisit the fruitless testimony of two more fading star witnesses who have failed to testify to any presidential wrongdoing, much less evidence of high crimes and misdemeanors. Both of the majority witnesses are frustrated would-be business partners of Hunter Biden, who tried to leverage the Biden name, or the Biden brand, as they keep calling it. But they never got any business off the ground for reasons that will become painfully obvious to anyone watching the proceedings today. Even Hunter Biden, laboring at the time under a serious substance abuse addiction, could tell these were not the type of people he should be doing business with. So rather than representing the Biden brand, which was their ardent wish, they now show up today as loyal servants of Trump world, each of them proudly represented by their very own former Trump White House attorney. The first is Mr. Bobolinsky, the bitterly disappointed wannabe Hunter business partner whose famously litigious history includes unsuccessfully suing his own dying father's charity for nearly a million dollars. And just last month, suing Cassidy Hutchinson for $10 million after she reported that Mr. Bobolinsky wearing a ski mask met with Mark Meadows, which Ms. Hutchison is now backed up with actual documentary photographic evidence, something in very short supply in this investigation. Mr. Bobolinsky made his hazy allegations against the Bidens public for the first time at a press conference choreographed by the Trump for President campaign, which provided him a venue, a gaggle of journalists, and even a dress shirt that they went out and bought for him uh, to wear to the event. Hours later, Mr. Bobolinsky joined the second 2020 presidential debate as Donald Trump's personal guest, where he was seated with Kid Rock and Mark Meadows. The other star witness, Mr. Galanis, who I believe is appearing by Zoom today, is a serial fraudster and convicted con man, a term I would charitably not use on a witness, except it was explicitly bestowed upon him by not one, but two different US federal district court judges, including the one who sentenced him to over 15 years in prison for defrauding union pension funds, a Native American tribe, and scores of innocent investors. Mr. Galanis was sentenced to pay restitution of over $80 million to his victims. That's a lot of money. That's what Donald Trump was sentenced to pay uh, E. Jean Carroll for in that civil litigation. The very first record of Mr. Galanis's claims against the Biden family appeared, check this out, in the clemency petition that he sent from prison to President Trump. Um, but the key point is this. Even if we were to believe every single word offered by these utterly compromised and biased witnesses, Mr. Bobolinsky, Mr. Galanis, their allegations don't identify any wrongdoing much less an impeachable offense by President Biden. With the impeachment bus running on empty, our GEO colleagues now are apparently preparing to save face by ending the impeachment farce with criminal referrals. But criminal referrals require evidence of crimes. 
And the only crimes we have seen are those of the GOP's own star witnesses, like Russian asset Alex Smirnoff, Chinese agent Gal Luft, Devin Archer, and Jason Galanis. The minority witness today, our witness, Lev Parnas, casts a piercing light on what's really taking place here. And Mr. Parnas has reason to know. He too used to be a mega sycophant peddling lies and disinformation to smear Joe Biden. Today he joins a long line of self-exiles from Trump world who could no longer stomach all the corruption and deceit. People like Cassidy Hutchinson, people like Michael Cohen, Sarah Matthews, Alyssa Griffin, General James Mattis, the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Mark Milley, General John Kelly, and now Vice President Mike Pence, who refuses to endorse for president the man he served with. But we do have loyal sycophants still in the room, and one day I look forward to hearing their testimony about how they got sunk into this religious cult. Mr. Parnas wrote Chairman Comer and me a remarkable letter on July 23rd, 2023. This is the first time I'm meeting him today. He was Rudy Giuliani's right-hand man, his globetrotting business partner and language interpreter in the mission to manufacture Ukraine and Burisma-related dirt and smears against Joe Biden in 2018 and 2019. He spent all of his time traveling around the world trying to stage uh, evidence against Joe Biden. In his letter, Parnas explains that the desperate search to find evidence of any kind of Biden corruption was a complete and total bust because there was no evidence to find. He wrote to tell us that not only is there no evidence in Ukraine that Joe Biden did anything improper, but more darkly, the manic search for a smoking gun against Biden became a mission to invent and concoct evidence out of thin air with the active help of Russian intelligence assets and agents. A man, I'm getting to Russia, you haven't heard anything yet, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a man who has reckoned with his own moral descent into Trump world, Lev Parnas is ashamed of what he did to serve the interests of Russian propaganda and Putin's lies. And he wants America to know the truth. He can explain how the Russian stimulated conspiracy theories and lies that he promoted with Rudy Giuliani live on in the tiresome fabrication spread by Alex Smirnoff and now repeated by this committee like Pavlov's dog. At every turn, my colleagues cry Russia hoax even in the face of repeated warnings from Donald Trump's own Treasury Secretary and Secretary of State, from the intelligence community, from Robert Mueller, and most recently from Special Counsel Weiss, who was named to office by Donald Trump. As Secretary Mnuchin stated, quote, Russian disinformation campaigns targeting American citizens are a threat to our democracy. That's Secretary Mnuchin, someone that you guys usually defend, but my GOP colleagues continue to cry Russia hoax like cult members selling flowers at the airport. Our colleagues are the ones loyally amplifying the actual Russian hoax, not the Russia hoax, the Russian hoax, the one that Giuliani and Trump and Smirnoff have eagerly, eagerly adopted from Putin and his agents. They participate in this hoax while they shamefully block $60 billion in military assistance to President Zelensky and the besieged Ukrainian people five years after Trump and Giuliani tried to shake President Zelensky down for counterfeit dirt on Joe Biden. And while they continue to parrot these transparent Russian lies, Vladimir Putin wages his bloody aggressive war on Ukraine filled with atrocities like the mass kidnapping of children and the rape and slaughter of civilians. The MAGA rights wholesale adoption of this Russian hoax and their sellout of the Ukrainian people by the MAGA right is an historic betrayal of democracy, freedom, and the rule of law. But the defense of democracy begins with fidelity to the truth and the oversight Democrats, America's truth squad, against this disinformation is here today to set the record straight. I yield back to you, Mr. Chairman.
I would now like to introduce our witnesses. Mr. Tony Bobolinsky. Mr. Bobolinsky was a business